following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Meditation is the esoteric practice of the Gnostics, as Samuel Amvior said. The science and practice of meditation is the essential element that leads the consciousness towards understanding. To become a Gnostic means to become a master of meditation. These two are synonymous. You cannot be a Gnostic if you cannot meditate. And this is because, as you know, the word gnosis means conscious experience of the truth. Gnosis refers to a kind of experiential understanding or comprehension of the way existence works. Merely having theories, beliefs, or ideas is not Gnosis. And for us to acquire conscious knowledge, real knowledge, it cannot be acquired through the five senses. And this is the most critical aspect. To state that again, if you want to have conscious knowledge of the laws that manage all existence, you cannot acquire that through your five senses. It is impossible. And this is because the realm of the five senses is simply the lowest, most dense, aspect of existence. It is only a fraction of what exists. In fact, it is the sum or the end. It is the bottom. It is the mixture. It is the result. What we see and experience physically is the result of causes. The causes are the laws themselves. Therefore, if you want knowledge of the laws, you can only get so much knowledge by observing or experiencing the result of those laws. To modify the law, to work with the law, you have to go to the cause. Stated another way, and by means of analogy, if you're sick and dying, you cannot treat and cure your illness by treating the symptoms, which is, anyway, what we do. We get a cold and we take a cough suppressant, or we take something to suppress our runny nose. We don't deal with the cause of the illness. We ignore the cause. We want to avoid the cause. And this is happens when we're sick physically, but it's true also psychologically. We avoid the causes of our illnesses psychologically. To know those causes 
we have to go to where they exist. And the causes of suffering are not physical. The causes of suffering cannot be found with your physical senses. They have to be found with psychological senses, with spiritual senses, because that's where those causes exist, in the psyche, in the soul. Therefore, meditation is the esoteric science of the Gnostics, the heart science, the heart practice. Many people believe, when they study the works of Samuel Ambior and the many uh, teachings about Gnosis, that sexual alchemy or transmutation is the heart practice of the Gnostics. And this is not true. It is the foundational practice, yes. But merely practicing transmutation does not create a Gnostic. Practicing transmutation does create but it can create either evil or good because transmutation is Da'at, the tree of knowledge. And that tree of knowledge is good or evil. It depends upon how that energy is conditioned. Our energy is conditioned with ego. We are, by a vast majority, in terms of our consciousness and our psyche, trapped in desire. We are trapped in grasping at a self that is false. And because of that, our energy is polarized negatively. So even if we transmute our energy, it does not mean that we will become an angel, a Buddha, a master, a Gnostic. It merely means that we're transforming energy. What makes one a Gnostic, a Buddha, a master, is conscious knowledge of the truth. That is only acquired through meditation. There is no other way to acquire it. You cannot get it through a book, and you cannot get it through hearing someone talk. You can only get it through yourself inside. That's why we study this path. Therefore, upon that basis, it's essential for us to become a master of meditation. This is the only way that we can guarantee ourselves the ability to transform and overcome suffering. And this is why Samael Ambior relentlessly demanded that the students meditate rigorously. He didn't say that one should meditate occasionally or off and on or just a little bit. He demanded rigorous, consistent, persistent meditation. He emphasized super efforts. Those super efforts are not with terrestrial activities, making money, becoming famous, studying books. They are not with memorization. They are not with modifying our personality so that we look like a Gnostic. Those super efforts are super efforts of consciousness. To be attentive, to be awake. To see oneself as one truly is. Curiously, he also said to not exert oneself. And this has been a cause for some confusion. Because on the one hand, he said, we have to make super efforts. And yet, at the same time, he said, one cannot know the truth through exertion. So what does that mean? How do we resolve this apparent contradiction? In reality, there is no contradiction in these two statements. It is a matter of understanding what they mean. The Buddha Shakyamuni, when he gave his very first teaching, 
This is called uh, the turning of the wheel of the Dharma, the first turning of the wheel. And in that teaching, he gave to humanity a tremendous truth, which is the four noble truths. These four noble truths underscore and explain everything about the path. By comprehending the nature of the Four Noble Truths, consciously, not just with the intellect, but with your heart, you can keep yourself on the path. This is essential, because our mind wants to take us out. What are those Four Noble Truths? The first states that life is suffering. None of us comprehend that. None of us. Because we persist in our illusions that in life we can find and satisfy our desires. And therefore we think, we believe that we will be happy if only we can satisfy our desires. Some of us have desires related with money, some with sex, some with food, or status, or security. But in all cases, these desires are, on the superficial level, modifications of our personality. Desires that are celebrated because of our personality. Such as, we may have grown up in a well-educated family, so to our personality, success means to be well-educated and to have a good job and to have a house and a family, raise kids, etc. To our personality, that is success and happiness. But in the ego, which is driving that personality, those desires are rooted in pride, to, to have everyone admire us. They are rooted in envy, because we want what others have. They are rooted in jealousy because we want to control our spouse, our children. They are rooted in fear because we want social, environmental, and economic security. So all of these desires, which modify our personality, push us to live in a way that is not realistic and that is founded in illusion. All swirling around a self that does not exist and that in itself inherently is empty, is a lie. Thus, life is suffering because we live in ignorance of our true nature. We ignore who our being is. We do not have conscious knowledge of our innermost. Instead, we are trapped in this self-created illusion of self, of I. Thus, the first noble truth, life is suffering. The second noble truth, suffering is caused by desire. But this desire that causes suffering is not merely the desire to eat, to fornicate, to gather wealth, to get revenge, to dominate. The root desire is a desire for self. It is a desire to be in accordance with one's idea. It is a grasping at a self that does not exist. That self is personality, all those surface level characteristics, and it is ego, all of the psychological characteristics behind the personality. That whole mass of aggregates that conjunction of competing wills is inherently empty of existence. It is not real. We want it to be real. We desire to feel I, me, myself. That is the root desire that causes suffering. And we ignore it, this fact. We ignore that that self is false. We ignore that the real self is the being. 
And thus, life is suffering, and suffering is caused by desire. The third noble truth states that there is an antidote to suffering. Once again, we ignore this. In our day-to-day life, in our moment-to-moment life, we ignore that there is an antidote. Even those who long for spirituality, who long for religion to unite once again with God, do it through an eye. They create a Gnostic eye, a Buddhist eye, a Christian eye, a self that loves to feel spiritual, that loves to feel a part of a group, that loves to feel saved, special. This I is false. This I loves to feel itself, but it is a lie. It doesn't see the true nature of the path. That the antidote to suffering is the absence of the I. The fourth noble truth explains the path to liberation from suffering. The fourth noble truth explains what the third noble truth posits. The third truth says there is a path out of suffering. There is a path to liberation. The fourth truth explains it. The fourth truth is the eightfold path. It is called eightfold because in Buddhism, that path is described as having eight fundamental characteristics. Those characteristics are right view, right intention, right communication, right action, right vocation, right effort, right attention, and right presence. The word right is not a very good translation. What it should imply is harmonious. Not right or left, not something dualistic, as in right or wrong, but something beyond duality, something beyond good and bad, something that is. This is what this word right should imply, but in English there's no word like that. So people use the word right view. These eight aspects are not separate things. They are not steps on a ladder. They are eight facets of one thing, which is the fourth truth, the path to liberation. In Buddhism, that path to liberation is defined as the cessation of suffering. In other words, the eradication of that first truth. The cessation of suffering. And what that Eightfold Path posits in its synthesis is simply this. In order to experience the cessation of suffering, you must remove the cause of suffering, which is desire. And desire exists because of the false I. Therefore, remove that false I, then desire ceases to be, then suffering ceases to be, and the entire wheel is broken. You can see now how beautiful that first teaching of the Buddha is, and how powerful. And yet, we don't understand it. Intellectually, we may have heard this teaching. We may have read books. We may have heard lectures. We may have been meditating for 20 years. We may have been a Buddhist who's taken vows. But we don't comprehend it. Because we're still here. We're still afflicted with karma. We still suffer. One who has comprehended the Four Noble Truths completely is out of the wheel of suffering. completely because that one has grasped the truth buried in those four noble truths which is 
Pratitya Samutpala. That's a Sanskrit word that can be translated in many ways. The most common is dependent origination. And what that word means is all things that are manifested are empty of inherent existence and depend upon other things. They are all impermanent. All forms are empty and all emptiness is form. That teaching is synthesized in the heart of all of the sutras and tantras, which is the Pranya Paramita Sutra, the heart of Wisdom Sutra, which has been chanted daily for 2,000 years by the Buddhists, and which Samael and Vyor studied very deeply through meditation and acquired the ability to understand it through his experience. And he wrote about that and explained that. These eight steps of the path are one action, conscious, in order to acquire the conscious experience of that emptiness, the true nature of existence, the true nature of of what is in us. The intellect struggles to grasp what this means because the concepts are completely contrary to what we feel is ourselves. The only way to really grasp it is to practice. Thus, we need to learn to meditate. When we study these eight steps, they have many levels of meaning and imply many things. But you can look at them on a superficial level and see how the first seven are concerned with how we conduct ourselves from moment to moment. The first one is right view. This word, view, is the basis for the rest of the eight. And in the context of Gnosis or Mahayana, any Mahayana tradition, view points towards the Pranya Paramita. If you studied the Paramitas, by the way, Pranya is the most elevated one and directly related with this. Pranya means wisdom in Sanskrit. Wisdom or intelligence or comprehension. And it's related with bina. It is intelligence, but the intelligence of God. And it is this intelligence that resides between two abysses or chaoses. The first, which separates the upper triangle from the lower tree, and the second, which is the absolute. Bina is that aspect of that trinity that comprehends the relationship between emptiness and form. Binya is pranya. In this sutra, the heart of wisdom, Avalokiteshvara, the bodhisattva, explains form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form, too, is not other than emptiness. Likewise, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness are all empty. Therefore, Shariputra, all phenomena are empty. They are without defining characteristics. They are not born. They do not cease. They are not defiled. They are not undefiled. They are not deficient, and they are not complete. To comprehend how existence and non-existence are one thing is only possible in the realm of Bina, which is Pranya. That's why this scripture, the Heart of Wisdom, is called Bhagavati. One of its names in Sanskrit. 
the, the full Sanskrit name is Bhagavati Pranya Paramita Hridaya. Bhagavati implies a divine mother. And that divine mother is the one who gives birth to any Buddha. Bhagavati is Bina on the tree of life. The divine mother, intelligence, wisdom, prana, comprehension. It is in that realm that we can grasp the two truths simultaneously. Conventional existence and ultimate existence. The vision, the right view, is the ability to see the true at the same time simultaneously as one cognitive event. This is only possible for someone who has reached that level of Bina, who has their consciousness vibrating in that level of Pranya. That is why we have to meditate. To learn that. This is not an unreachable goal. Anyone can experience it. But to reach it, one has to learn how to place the consciousness in perfect equanimity. Perfect serenity. And that's why we have this Eightfold Path. So you see, right view is the perception of emptiness the void, the absolute. Notice that I said perception. Not the idea. Not the theory. The vision. To actually see it. To experience it. That is right view when it's fully developed. For us, we're not there yet. We're caught in wrong view. This idea of self, this I that we worship, is wrong view because it believes in an existence that is false. To cultivate right view, we have to awaken our consciousness. Not tomorrow. Now. And that right view begins by analyzing this self. Not with the intellect, not with beliefs, but with cognitive perception. It is to look at oneself looking for what is real, questioning, not sitting back in this identity, this cage and just going with the flow of life. Not just going along with our karma, with our situations, with our desires, but questioning them through a cognitive perception. From moment to moment, to look in oneself with the conscious analysis, analysis of where is myself? Who am I? Who is this desire? Who is it in me that wants money? Is it my being? Who is it in me that wants to be admired? That wants to feel secure? That wants a title or success or comfort? Who is it? Again, these are not intellectual questions. They are perceptive cognizance. It is a way of observing oneself, watching oneself, creating an inner separation. This requires effort. Enormous effort. Super efforts. Yet, it has to happen within a space of non-exertion. That is, our consciousness, our inner watchfulness, needs to be serene and natural. You see, to be is effortless. 
It's when we want to be something that we're not, that we exert ourselves. When we want to project an image that is not true, we exert ourselves. When we want something that doesn't belong to us, we exert ourselves. When we want security, when we want to look like we know something and be respected, when we want to dominate, when we want to express our anger, when we want revenge, when we want to satisfy our lust, when we want others to envy us, we exert our mind. We project an image. We talk a certain way. We dress a certain way. We walk a certain way. We act a certain way. All of those desires, those cravings, manipulate our personality to project that self so that others will give us what we want or so that our desires will get what they want. All of that is a kind of exertion psychologically that is founded in desire, in the illusion of I, and that creates suffering. Right view is to see that for what it is. It is the effort to see our projections, our cravings, our aversions, our desires, our egos for what they are. That takes effort. But to be in the space within which one can do it, one must not exert oneself. In other words, you must not project your I. You have to be, and that's all. To just be. For example, if you face a great crisis, a big problem, you feel inside this urgency to act, to do something, to exert yourself, right? If you're out of work, money is a real problem, and you feel that pain and that urgency to do something, to show an image of yourself so you'll get hired or you'll get a job, to project some image to an interviewer or to a client so that you will get some job and get money. That is exertion, which is false. But if you make the effort to be, make the effort to see yourself as you are and relax and let go of those desires and remember your being. Not just think about your being, but feel your being. And not just for an instant, but continually. Suddenly, that exertion goes away. This is why Jesus in the gospel said, why do you worry about such things? Have you not seen the lilies of the field or the birds of the air and how finely God clothes them? How much more precious are you to God than a bird or a flower? Do you really forget that he will clothe you also? We do forget. But if we remember, we put our trust in that, we exert nothing from ourselves, but place ourselves in the hands of our innermost. Suddenly the answer comes naturally, spontaneously, without exertion. You may have experienced something similar when without thinking of the problem, without analyzing the problem, while in a totally separate psychological state, perhaps doing something relaxing like taking a nap or a shower, suddenly the answer pops into your head. <gasps> so easy. This is what I have to do. I'm sure everyone's had some experience like that. That illustrates this point. The truth comes when we least expect it. The truth comes without exertion. It comes naturally. Likewise, this is how meditation works. If you're making enormous 
exertion in meditation, you're going the wrong direction. Meditation, true meditation, is effortless. Easy. Because it's natural. It's spontaneous. It is part of our true nature. To experience that, to experience the nature of your innermost, requires no exertion at all. What it requires is that you are being, that your mind is in a state of serenity and your consciousness is active and awake. And in that state, experiences emerge spontaneously, naturally, because that is the function of the consciousness. Therefore, we need this right, upright path of eightfold steps. Right view is to learn to see the self for what it is. To not merely assume that this identity is real, but to question it. When we feel the urge of anger, or we feel the emotion of pride, we have to become cognizant of that and look into it and see what in that is real. What in that fundamentally exists. A simple example of that would be to look at sensations. Because all desire works through sensations. Form. When you feel hungry, your body is telling you you need to eat. But desire gets in the way. Desire takes control of that and says, I want chocolate. Or I want a hamburger. And we feel that craving for that sensation of the hamburger. And some of us can even act crazy trying to satisfy that desire. We can become angry. We can become resentful. We can manipulate people. We can pant. I mean, we can rant and rave. We all have different ways of satisfying our urges, our desires. Some very passive and, and not noticeable, and some very do dominant. Nonetheless, at the root of those behaviors is that craving for a sensation. And we ignore the true nature of that sensation because we don't have right view. We don't see that that sensation is truly empty and impermanent. So we make enormous effort to satisfy that craving. And this is a dumb example just to eat something, right? But we can make great sacrifices and go a long way and make a lot of effort to get a hamburger or to eat something that we want to eat or to buy something that we want to buy, like a new phone, a new car. We can spend months and months researching, craving, saving money, all with this urge to buy this thing but we don't question the urge. We don't see the emptiness of the desire. We don't see the I behind it. Furthermore, when we get it, when we get the thing we want, we indulge in the sensation. We enjoy it. So that pendulum of pleasure swings towards pleasure. We enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. But then that pleasure starts to fade, inevitably. After three or four bites of that hamburger, it doesn't taste that great anymore. Maybe we finish it, and then we're full and we're stuffed. We don't feel comfortable. Or, or we may even feel like, ugh, no more hamburgers. Sick of it. We don't see the pendulum. We don't see that a sensation arises, is sustained briefly, and then decays and goes away. We fail to see the impermanence of it, the dependent origination of it. And so we end up being slaves of that one inch of our body. Do you realize that? It is one inch, the tongue. And we're slaves of it. What about the rest? What about all the other senses that we are enslaved by? Our sight, our hearing, our smell, our touch. We are enslaved by desires through the senses. If we can apply right view... 
and begin to analyze those sensations, to see them for what they are, we can start to transform our lives, to have conscious control over ourselves and not be a victim of suffering, the suffering we create. This is true not just for a silly example like food, but for more serious examples like lust, like pride, like envy. Envy might be the worst. We all know from our studies and lectures that lust is the root of the ego. But the one that creates the most suffering in our lives, in our society, is envy. You see, lust creates suffering for yourself, but envy creates suffering for everyone. When you lust after someone or something or a sensation and you want to satisfy that lust, it affects you and you suffer. But when you envy or when someone envies you, there's two people involved, maybe more. The suffering is worse. It's multiplied. But what is envy? I'll read you a quote from Samuel M. Vior. Envy is one of the most powerful triggers of social machinery. Why do so many people want to progress? Why do so many people want to have beautiful residences and very elegant cars? The entire world envies what belongs to others. Envy is regret for the well-being of others. Elegant women are envied by other less elegant women. And this serves to intensify their struggle and pain. Those who do not have, want to have. And will choose to not eat in order to buy all types of clothes and adornments. They do this with the sole objective of not being less than anyone else. Every paladin of a great cause is mortally hated by the envious. The envy of the impotent, of the vanquished, of the mean person is disguised with the judge's toga or with the robe of sanctity and of mastery or with the sophism of applause or with the beauty of humility. If we integrally comprehend that we are envious, it is logical that envy will then end and in its place will appear the star that rejoices and shines for the well-being of others. How rare is it us for us to feel genuinely happy for someone else's success? For someone else's happiness? We might say it, but we usually feel envious because we want it too. That want is an I, which is not real, but which we created and sustain because of ignorance. In order for right view to deepen, for us to see the emptiness of this false self, we have these other steps of the right path, the upright path. Right intention is the second one. What is right intention? It is in Sanskrit, bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is the wisdom mind, the awakening mind. Right intention or motivation is the ultimate aspect of the bodhisattva path, which is to work on behalf of others. Gnosis is a Mahayana teaching. This tradition has its central goal to help others escape suffering. The true Gnostic does not do for themselves. 
a real Gnostic, does not do anything for themselves. Stated in Mahayana terms, a bodhisattva does every single action on behalf of others. Every action. That is right intention, right motivation. But that right intention is based in emptiness, based in the right view of prana paramita, the comprehension of inherent emptiness. Compassion and emptiness combined is full bodhicitta. The next step, third, is right speech, to respect the word, to use your tongue for the benefit of others. We use our tongue to benefit ourselves. And we use our tongue to destroy others. We love to criticize. We love to tell jokes. We love to belittle people. We love to make fun of people. We love to gossip. Rarely do we see anyone speak well of another. To speak well without envy. To speak well without pride. Rarely do we see love on the tongues of human beings. The fourth step is right action or right conduct. That is to use all your vehicles in the right way, based in the view of the true nature, which is empty, based in bodhicitta, to serve others. The fifth is right vocation. To work with the law of karma, karma in harmony. To work with that law in our day-to-day -day existence, in harmony, for the benefit of others. Six is right effort. What is right effort? It is called diligence. It is a virtue related with mercury. It is to not be lazy as a consciousness. It doesn't mean that you should be very busy in your physical day-to-day -day life. What it means is that you should be making the effort to be cognizant continually, to self-remember, to self-observe. That is, to sustain all the previous steps of the path, consciously, continually. And the next step is right attention or right mindfulness. And that is to not forget to be cognizant. To be mindful is to remain continual in one's effort. You see, to be conscious of oneself, we do that briefly. That is self-observation. But to be mindful is to continue that, to extend it. Mindfulness is to not forget, to be mindful of what you do. So we need to be mindful of being conscious. All of this leads to the eighth step, the eighth aspect, which is right presence. It could sound like six, seven, and eight are the same thing. And in fact, if you divide up these eight into a trinity, they are. Another way in Buddhism to look at the way to walk the path is in three aspects, view, meditation, and action. These three at the end are action. Meditation, rather. Meditation is built on these three. They sound similar because they're related. Right presence is prana, wisdom, meditation. When it says, sometimes you'll see this eighth step as concentration. It doesn't mean preliminary concentration. It means concentration in context of samadhi. The word samadhi is Sanskrit and can be translated as to hold without change. To be fixed permanently. So when you're concentrated, you have that, right? Concentration means to fix the attention in one thing. But samadhi is beyond mere concentration in English terms. Samadhi is a state of ecstasy.
So our goal as Gnostics or aspiring Gnostics is to learn how to unify these eight into one state of consciousness. This is not a state of consciousness that you only access every once in a while. But it is a state of consciousness that is eternal, natural, spontaneous, and immortal. And it's called Rigpa. It's the natural state of the mind. It is your Buddha nature. Your natural, awakened consciousness. When it's fully developed, it becomes Buddha. Which means awakened one. It's a title. The word Buddha is not a name. It's a title. There are many levels of Buddhas. Because everyone is at different levels of comprehension and understanding. But at the top, at the peak, beyond Bina on the Tree of Life, we find those Kayas. Sambhogakaya, Nirmanakaya, Dharmakaya. These are levels of Buddhahood that are preparing to enter the Absolute. To modify or to uh, manifest emptiness. In other words, they are going to have full and complete prana, prana paramita, that ability to simultaneously see the emptiness of all things and the form of all things, to see it, not as a theory, but through vision. In other words, they have accomplished the full path. For where we are, we start with studying the doctrine, trying to understand the concepts so that we can put them into practice. And we begin where we are now. Not just debating about emptiness, not just playing with the intellect, with concepts, but trying to experience it in our daily lives. Real Gnosis is acquired through experience, so we begin here. What is this I that we experience from moment to moment? Who is this I? So through the day, from when we first arise, we have to begin with this introspective analysis. Who is this? And with any element that emerges in our mind, we have to analyze that cognizantly, to look at what comes in our mind and to question it. We don't do that. We go with whatever arises. As soon as desires arise in the mind, we start acting on them. We wake up, we want coffee. We wake up, we want to eat. We want to turn on the TV. We want to run right to the internet, check our email. We want to go and start getting ready and making ourselves look pretty, to look attractive. Maybe today I'll meet the one. I better put on cologne. Not realizing that these urges are rooted in a false self. They are not authentic. They are false. They are lies that we tell ourselves. We begin there in our daily lives, questioning, why do I need to do these things? Why do I need to follow with these urges that emerge in my mind? Is that really what my being wants? Is that really in harmony with the law? The divine law? In this way, we can start to penetrate that cage to break it, to start to experience some freedom from the cage of suffering that we made. We start to free ourselves from the many forms of bondage 
that we have attached to ourselves, bondage to society, to family, to our mind. It doesn't mean that one retreats from the world and abandons the world. What it means is that rather than always feeding your own false self, you start to think seriously about the good of others. Because seriously, as an example, if you're going out to look for a job and you're dressing yourself up to look like something that you're not, and you get that job, you're going to suffer because you really don't belong there. You weren't being yourself. Same with a spouse. You dress a certain way and act a certain way and talk a certain way and project an image that you think will catch a person, but then you get them. You weren't being honest. None of that was really you. You will suffer, and that person will suffer, and you did it. Be honest. Be authentic. Not the I, not the ego, the being. The difficulty here, firstly, is learning to do that. This requires enormous effort. One instant of inattention, like that, and we fall asleep again, hypnotized by the ego, by the personality. One instant, one distraction. Can you maintain perfect cognizance of all the desires in your mind for a few seconds? For a few minutes? You might be able to. But then what if you go into a store? What if you go to Walmart? Or Borders? Or the record shop? Or worse, a computer store? All of that self-remembering stuff goes right out the window. Because all around you are all these beautiful little things that you really want. Why? Do you not realize that everything around us in this society is designed to manipulate you through sensation? It is designed to do it. All of our advertising, every single advertisement, is designed to manipulate you through sensation. To make you feel a certain way so that you'll give them money. If you buy this product, you'll feel beautiful through sensation. If you buy this product, you will feel powerful. You will feel like a man. If you drink alcohol, you'll feel tough. Mature, grown up, a rebel. We want to feel those things. So we succumb to the addiction to sensation. Who has the ability to conquer that? Who has the ability to conquer sensation? We've been studying about Cain and Abel in recent lectures. And we've understood that. Cain represents the mind, the ego, in other words. Abel represents the consciousness, the soul. But let us understand something about that symbol. The word habel, Abel, in Hebrew, means futility. How is that? How can the symbol of the consciousness mean futility, vapor, or breath, or smoke. These are the translations for that word, Abel, Habel. How is that? If we read the Gospels literally, if we read Gnosis literally, we could become confused. It must be a mistake. It's no mistake. It's actually beautiful. But to understand it, you need to understand the absolute. You need to understand pratitya samutpara. 
dependent origination. Habel, or Abel, represents nefesh, the soul that enters into manifestation in order to fulfill its duty, which is to serve God, to serve the innermost. But Habel is not the self. Habel is vapor, breath, smoke, futility. Habel is merely a vessel through which God can work. But Habel does not exist without Adam and Eve. Likewise, our consciousness is empty. We talk a lot about consciousness. So when you begin to question and analyze yourself, where is my self? Where is my real self? Where am I? Who am I that's asking this? Who am I that is looking out through these eyeballs and hearing through these ears? Who is that? Can you really answer it? Can you find something that exists independently of those other aspects? Eyes, ears, taste, touch. Can you find that? Physically, you cannot. If you didn't have your eyes, your ears, your taste, your touch, how would you experience anything? Have you had that experience? No. If you had, who were you then? This type of introspection leads you very deep. If you get out of your physical body and you find yourself in the astral plane, you can ask yourself, who am I? Who is this? Where am I? And this is the purpose of the exercise SOL, subject, object, location. Questioning one's environment, questioning oneself. What is this? Where am I? Is this real? What dimension am I in? But when you introspect into that analysis of self, you find no self. So who is this that's asking, that's seeing that's experiencing. You have to answer that. But you cannot answer it with the intellect. Cain. Cain doesn't know. Cain is a murderer and a thief. Cain, when restored, has his function, which is to serve the spirit. Abel also does not know. Abel serves God, but is killed by Cain. But when we look into Abel, we see Abel means futility, vapor, breath, smoke. What reality is there in that? There is none. Because for Cain and Abel to exist, there must have been Adam and Eve. And who are Adam and Eve but a symbol of our innermost? You see, in each level of our constitution, psychologically and spiritually, we find no self. Physically, you inquire into this. Who is my self? Is there a self that exists here, immortal, independent, eternal? No. No. This physical body will die. So we know the physical body is not self. So then we develop the ability to get out of the body. And we analyze the vital body in the fourth dimension. The same analysis. But this body also does not exist in and of itself forever. It is temporal. It is born. It sustains briefly. Then it dies just like a sensation. It's not permanent. Why should we trust it? Why should we rely on it? Why should we believe that is a self when it will end? Then we go into our astral body, our emotional body, conscious, awake in the astral plane, and we say, is this me? Is this my self? Well, this body, if it's lunar, it clearly is not, because that body will be dissolved. 
by nature. It will die. Likewise with the mental body, it will die. But if we've created solar bodies, then we might have cause to pause on this question. Are these myself? No. Because without God, they cannot exist. Without the innermost, they cannot act. Without the spirit, they are dead. So therefore, Abel, Habel, the soul, is not the self. It is empty. Habel, Abel, the soul, is vapor, breath, smoke. Because for it to act, the spirit must be there. And then we go further to the body of will. We go further into the body of consciousness, Gebra. We go further into the atmic body, Chesed. Always with this introspection. Is this myself? Is this me? This might sound familiar to you because Samael and Vior gave this very practice to do this. But one has to be able to do it consciously. And most of us can't get out of the physical body consciously, much less go to the fourth, fifth, and sixth dimensions in order by will. We can learn it, but it takes effort. In the end, even our innermost, even chesed, is not our real self. We say chesed is our self, our spirit. But in the context of Buddhism, in the context of the highest philosophies in Gnosis, even chesed is dependent upon the Absolute. Therefore, the highest truth, the highest level of self, is the Ein Sof. It is emptiness. The limitless This is the ultimate conclusion that one will arrive upon if you consciously, cognizantly investigate. So how do we make this practical? How do we make our meditation without exertion? Most of us struggle to meditate. We fight. This is necessary. But who are you fighting? You have to be fighting against the right elements in order to succeed, to become a master of meditation. Are you fighting the false self? Or are you fighting against the truth? Most of us, when we begin to meditate, begin with a craving, a desire to be a master to be admired, to be a big shot, to be a know-it-all, to be sought after, to be worshipped. Some of us are not that grandiose. Some of us start to meditate because we have the desire to experience samadhi, to know God, to talk to an angel, to talk to Jesus, to talk to Buddha. These longings are good. We need them. Our consciousness, our soul needs that. But unfortunately, our ego tends to harness them and make them into desires. The same way we desire chocolate cake or hot dogs. This is where the difference arises between effort and exertion. Experiences in meditation are easy if there is no desire present in meditation. Therefore, when you meditate, observe yourself. Are you craving silence? Do you desire experience? Are you craving to get out of the body? Then you will not. Experience in meditation comes when the mind is in equanimity. What is equanimity? Equanimity 
is a form of equilibrium. I think I spelled that wrong. Equanimity. Anyhow. Equanimity. I think I still spelled it wrong. A state of equanimity neither craves or avoids. It is not for or against. It simply is. We rarely experience this. We rarely experience a state of equanimity because we are so slaved by desires, cravings, and aversions that we're always swinging from one to the other. We're craving experiences in meditation and trying to avoid pain. So we sit to meditate and our knees hurt, our back hurts, our neck hurts. We're trying to avoid those pains while we're craving experiences. We're going nowhere. Equanimity, another beautiful word for this, acceptance. Acceptance. Let it be what it is. When you sit to meditate and you begin to observe your mind, let it be whatever it is. If their mind is active, then just watch your active mind. Just observe that and see. Whatever arises in your mind, you say, yeah, I see these thoughts. I'm aware of these thoughts. I'm aware of these desires. I'm aware of this pain. And if the mind is quiet, you say, yeah, okay. The mind is quiet. Not yippee. <laughs> because that yippee is a desire. Equanimity. But you can't create this just in meditation. You have to be creating this all the time. From moment to moment, every instant of your waking and sleeping life, to observe all phenomenon and to see them for what they are. To stop projecting yourself and trying to change the whole world and to just accept it. To be in equanimity. If someone praises you, you don't say, yeah, yeah, tell me more. You also don't say, ah, shut up. You hear it, you let it go. It arises, it sustains, it passes away. If someone criticizes you, you don't say, hey, shut up. You also don't say, hey, tell me more. You just hear it and you let it go. You don't react. You don't try to control them. You don't try to change what they say. You accept it and you comprehend it. When you comprehend praise or criticism, you realize it's empty. Who are they praising? A false self? An ego? A personality? A physical body that will die? What's the point? What good is any praise of something impermanent that only creates suffering? Likewise, what good is any criticism? Are they criticizing my body, my personality, my desire? Or are they criticizing my being? In any case, it doesn't matter. My being is God. I'm just an ant. An ant will die. So they criticize the ant. Does that make them tough? Does that make them good? Does that make them better than me or worse than me? No. It's irrelevant. It's empty. If they praise or criticize my being, so what? He's still my being. It's irrelevant. Likewise with problems. We tend to get very identified with problems. What do I do? What do I do? Going to everybody trying to get advice and opinions and trying to solve these problems with a lot of exertion. We don't just accept them. If we accepted problems, the solution would be self-evident. Immediate. Because 
It's quite simple. If you have a problem and there is a solution, you will solve it. And if you have a problem and there is no solution, you will not solve it. So why do you get upset? Why do we get upset? Because of the I. I didn't make that up. That's from Shanti Deva. Beautiful and true. So in every case, in our day-to-day life, we have to cultivate this point of view to see the emptiness, to develop equanimity, to be the same, to be a person who loves others, who cherishes others above themselves. This is Gnosis. This is Mahayana. This is real Dharma. To cherish others above ourselves. To have equanimity. If someone's mean to us, we accept that. It doesn't mean we should let somebody perform violence against us. No, we have to act. But emotionally, spiritually, we should not react. We should not blame them. We should not be angry with them. We should love them. People who are angry are suffering. Do you ever reflect on that? When someone's angry with you and criticizing you and attacking you, why do we get mad in return? How does anger solve it? It doesn't. It makes it worse. If we responded with love, with understanding, with compassion, the anger would be diffused. Right? Love can solve it. Anger cannot. In this way, in every situation, we cultivate this equanimity to be in the middle. Neither praising or blaming, neither craving or avoiding, accepting, seeing things as they are. And this conscious point of view sets the stage for meditation to become effortless. Because then when we sit to meditate, the only difference is we close our eyes. We close our eyes and we begin to reflect on what is in our mind. What's emerging? What is my mood? Am I tense? So usually the first thing we do is we observe our three brains. We take a comfortable position and we close our eyes and we pass our consciousness around our body and we look and see, where am I tense? And why? We relax. We accept it. If we're sick, or we have a physical pain of some kind, or we're suffering in some way, we accept it. We relax. We let the body just rest. Then we do the same with our emotional state. What is my psychological mood? Am I anxious? Am I excited? Do I feel lazy? Do I feel resentful? Do I feel confused, conflicted? And then whatever we find, we observe. And we start to just relax and let it be what it is. Not resisting and not craving. You see, physically, we resist and crave. Emotionally, we resist and crave. And also in the mind. So likewise, through each of the three brains, body, heart, mind. Relax. You could easily take several years to learn how to do this. Just what I described. Because the mind is so chaotic. And we're so ignorant of what's happening in us physically and psychologically. But please do it. Even if it takes you 10 years. Because once you learn this, meditation's easy. Meditation is not complicated, neither is it hard. It's natural, it's easy, it's spontaneous, it's normal. The reason we can't do it is because we ignore the truth of our situation. We're craving things and avoiding things. So start with your three brains. Sit, observe your body, observe, whoops, observe your heart, and observe your mind. Three brains. Don't look 
at the clock. This is another big mistake. Don't say, I'm going to meditate for 10 minutes, and you sit down and you're watching constantly for 10 minutes, or 20 minutes, or an hour. Forget the clock. That means don't sit to meditate before you go to work when you've got to leave the house in 15 minutes because you're just going to be agitated and you're going to waste your time. Do something to relax yourself. Take a walk. When you're ready to meditate, don't have anything planned afterwards. You sit to meditate and you have to forget everything else. When the body is relaxed, when the heart is relaxed, when the mind is relaxed, here comes the most important thing. This only happens after you've relaxed. Abandon your physical senses. This is why, in my opinion, guided meditation is harmful. I do not teach guided meditation. Because when you are receiving guided meditation, you remain attached to your sense of hearing. Therefore, you remain in your body. Therefore, you cannot get out to have some money. This is harmful. To truly meditate, you have to abandon the five senses. You have to abandon the body. And once you do that, then you go even further. You abandon the vital body, the astral body, the mental body, the causal body. This is how you go through successive levels of samadhi. But you cannot reach any of them if you're sitting in your body observing or attached to a sensation like hearing or like a pain in your body or like a taste in your mouth or a smell or a sight. You cannot. That's why I also do not recommend music. It's okay to set a mood, but most of the time when we play music, we wind up sitting there listening to the music. And that's okay for relaxing, or if you're trying to meditate and get into that music, but if you're still listening through your ears, you will not get it. You have to get out of the body, out of the ears in order to meditate really in that music. You can do this with Beethoven, Mozart, Bach, all the great masters. And they will teach you beautiful things, but not while you're still in your body. You can use the music as a vessel to get out, but not if you're attached to your ear. You have to leave the ear behind. This cannot be emphasized enough. To really meditate, to really master this skill, to really experience what samadhi is, you have to abandon the body. And most of the time, the reason we cannot is because of fear. A lot of us have a lot of fear about meditation. Maybe we were raised Christian, and we were told again and again that meditation is of the devil. This is a tragic crime because meditation is the natural state. Through the practice of meditation, you access the natural state of your consciousness. All the prophets and saints learned and mastered meditation. Jesus himself is a great master of meditation. The best one. Because he achieved full prana. And he can teach that to you. So when you sit to meditate, you may have these obstacles. You may be sitting and, and realize, wow, I'm feeling a subtle fear. My heart is quaking about meditation. I'm afraid to meditate. Excellent that you can see that. Now rest in that. Relax in that. Look to see what is inside of that. Discover what is in it. What is the element that's manipulating you? Are you remembering your being? Are you remembering yourself? 
Maybe it's a desire. Maybe it's an aversion. Find those elements. They can be in any of the three brains. If you do this every day without expectations, but to do it because it's helping you, it's working, it's helping you see yourself, eventually, without expecting it, without desiring it, suddenly you'll realize you're having a beautiful experience out of your body, with your being, with an angel, with yourself. It happens naturally. You cannot force it. You cannot force the mind to be silent. You cannot force the body to relax. You cannot force the heart to be calm. You can only stop making them that way. Learn that. If your body is tense, it's because you made it tense. For it to relax, stop making it tense. Let go. Accept it. Relax. You can't force to be relaxed. You can't force yourself to calm down. You only make it worse. That is exertion, and that is wrong. You can't force your heart to be serene, to be happy, because happiness emerges spontaneously on its own. But you can stop making yourself feel anxious, sad, depressed, angry. But you do that by acceptance, by patience, by equanimity. And when that is sincere, the heart naturally becomes a serene, happy, serene, beautiful place. And the same with the mind. You cannot force your mind to be quiet. There are many who try. Many. Many schools of meditation are only that. They try to force your body, heart, and mind to be silent and still. They may go around with a stick or have a guard, and if you flinch or move or, twi or twitch your eye, they'll punish you. They may kick you out. They may hit you with the stick. I'm not making this up. I've been to those schools. I practiced in those schools. I know that technique. It doesn't work. It's completely antithetical to real meditation. It is the opposite. To really meditate, you have to stop forcing yourself. To really meditate, you shouldn't meditate with this sense of obligation like, oh, I have to meditate every day. What a drag. You need to analyze that. That is wrong view. It's wrong. It's harmful. That's poison. That attitude will take you right out. You won't last. You cannot. If you take meditation as something painful, unpleasant, poisonous, bad, hard, you're on the wrong foundation. This is why when we teach meditation, we try to encourage you to develop a practice that you find useful and beneficial that helps you to develop a sense of peace and serenity. But most of all, self-understanding. Don't burden yourself with, I've got to meditate six hours a day because some island viewer said so. Don't burden yourself with, if I don't meditate every day, my instructor's going to be mad at me and he's going to yell at me and then I don't know what I'm going to do. It's funny, but I know those people who think that way. There are a lot of them. It's sad. We should meditate and develop a practice of meditation because we want to, because it helps us. Work in that way. Then your meditation will be easy. It will feed you. It will nourish you. It will grow you. And you will love it. And you will find that nothing in life will give you as much. And I speak that from experience. At this point in my life, I'm prepared to give up anything, but not that. Everything of value that I have has come from meditation. And it's very simple. Observe 
yourself. Relax. Any questions? Masters and all talks about cricket sounds that we should listen to cricket sounds, right? To give, take us deeper into our consciousness, right? Same thing with the uh, bowls, the Tibetan bowls and stuff, right? Uh, Zen Buddhism, you know, practices of listening is a form of meditation, right? So there's uh, there's uh, mantras that we vocalize, right? To sedate the nervous system, right? These are all helpful tools. Right? I agree. So right. That's what we've got to emphasize, because we can't just say, okay, we're just going to do it this way, right? We need those tools, you know. So very few people are just going to jump into and work the way, you know, you're trying to explain it, right? I so disagree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me explain why, okay? Meditation is, alongside alchemy and astrology, is the oldest science on this planet. So in this very ancient science, there are hundreds of thousands of techniques. At the right time, for the right person, any one of them can be effective. I'm not trying to discourage anyone from practicing any technique that they want. And this is why in this school, we do not have a rigid structure of meditation, where you have to do one practice for a week and then you do another practice for a week or a month. We don't have that because we know that every student is at a different level and has a different need. This is obvious. Therefore, what I'm expressing in this lecture are principles of meditation. Principles. The principle is simply this. If you remain in your body, you will remain in your body, period. Whatever technique you use. If you're repeating a mantra, but you remain in your body doing the mantra, you can do that. You can do it for a thousand years. And that's all you'll get, is doing the mantra in your body. If you want to comprehend the mantra, you have to leave your body behind. Comprehension does not come from the five senses. What you can understand from the five senses in the body is only related to that level of existence. A mantra does not come from there. A mantra is a, is a crystallized sound that has emerged from the absolute. And to comprehend that, you have to go there. But you can't go there with your physical body. You can't go there with your vital body, or your astral body, or your mental body. Not even your causal body. You have to go there without any vehicles of any kind. Now this is a very high principle. I'm not suggesting that, that any of us could even do this today. But it's important to understand the concept so that we don't remain limited by the senses and the body. In this tradition, we teach hundreds of techniques. Mantras, pranayamas, vocalizations, different types of concentration practices, both formless and form-based. We teach exclusive and non-exclusive forms of concentration. We teach shamatha and vipassana. We teach Zen. Most of all, we teach practices that are related with Mahamudra and Dzogchen. And these are related with the highest form of Yoga Tantra. These are extremely high techniques. We rarely teach them. Why? Because people don't prepare themselves for them. People don't really learn to meditate. They learn to repeat a mantra. They may learn to sit in a certain posture, but they don't abandon the body. They don't enter samadhi at will. And this is the requirement. In order to learn the high techniques, you have to be able to enter samadhi at will. Anyone can do it. And to do it simply requires that you cultivate and prepare yourself for that. It isn't that it's hard. It just takes discipline. So on that note, let me encourage you, whatever practice you undertake, 
do it with your heart, but also do it with cognizance of what you're doing and study. You have to study meditation deeply. And I recommend you study all the traditions. Study what Samael wrote, study the Zen classics, study the Buddhist classics and the Hindu classics. All of them are different tools that point to the exact same thing. And once you get that, you can experience it. On the other hand, you don't need to read any books to learn to meditate. You can be completely illiterate. If you learn to listen to your intuition, to the guidance you get from your being, you can master meditation. And there are many who have done so. Many. Masters, Buddhas, who are completely illiterate. You don't need to know all these things that I've studied. It isn't necessary. What you have to know is how to use your consciousness. So use the tools. Each one has a place. We learn mantras, we learn pranayamas, and we learn other techniques because they all have a value. But their value is defined in the principle of this lecture, which is do not make exertion. Learn to accept, to be serene. Real meditation comes from this psycho psychological point of view. Another question? The question is about sensations that arise and uh, energetic sensations that arise during meditation and what one should do. The very profound and illuminated master, Milarepa, gave a lot of advice in relation with this type of question. Many students came to him and said, I'm having these visions in meditation, what do I do? Or I'm having this experience in meditation, what do I do? I saw this, I saw that. His answer was always the same. Do not become identified. See it for what it is. It's neither good or bad. It's just an illusion. Don't get hypnotized by the illusion. And this is the synthesis of this lecture. Whatever arises, be serene. Be the same. Don't react. Accept it. Observe it. And if you have to act, act consciously. But if you cannot act consciously, wait. Keep observing. Keep watching. And that's the simple answer. When you meditate, nothing might happen. So you need to analyze your practice and wait. Keep practicing. Or when you meditate, you might have all kinds of visions, whether good or bad. You could have disturbing visions, or visions that make you feel like you're a god. In both cases, the antidote is the same. Do not become hypnotized. They are just images. They are empty. They are not real. See through them. See them for what they are. Another question? Beautiful question. The question is, what do I do when meditation is hard and I don't want to do it? Study the doctrine. Study the teaching. Study meditation. If you don't want to meditate, it's because of one of two things. One, you still don't really understand what meditation is. Therefore, when you practice, you're not practicing in the right way. Or number two, some ego or element in you really doesn't want you to meditate. And so it's creating a lot of resistance. In both cases, the, the antidote is the same. Study the teaching. Listen to masters of meditation. Study what they've written and said. If meditation appears to you to be just painful and difficult and impossible, it's because you have not really understood what it is. So study. Another question? Yeah, I have another question. Okay. Um, how can life be suffering if there is a sensation of suffering in life? 
question is, how can life be suffering if there is a sensation of suffering? Cessation. Oh, cessation. Okay. To really answer the question about why life is suffering would require a whole lecture. And we've given a few in relation to that. Uh, in general, what we need to understand is that when we say the word suffering, we're not talking about physical pain. We're talking about a whole range of states of consciousness that are qualified as suffering. So I would recommend that you study that. Look into Buddhism or look into the lectures on the Gnostic teachings or Gnostic radio sites about suffering, and some of that will be explained. There's a question. That's a great question, too. What if we have really noisy neighbors that always jump around? And also, it, okay. it, and also, it was said that if we have a certain physical tension, we observe it, we accept it. It was said that we need to relax the physical body and to eventually forget about it. How can we relax and forget the body if we have a very intense pain, whether it's on our leg or back? Okay, two very good questions. The first one is about what if we have noisy neighbors who always jump around? I love that. I have neighbors like that. Right now, I have neighbors like that. They only bother you if you let them. A beautiful example of this is a parent. Have you ever observed a parent who looks perfectly serene and happy and loving their child even though the child is a screaming brat? <laughs> yeah. This is the attitude we have to cultivate for meditation also. That is equanimity. That is love. The way that parent shows so much love for that child, even though the child is spoiled rotten. That is compassion, love. We need the same attitude. If your neighbors are making noises and disturbing you, meditate on what in you is disturbed. What is it in you that is bothered? Intolerance? Pride? Laziness? Look at yourself. Analyze those qualities that come up. It's a perfect chance to meditate. The other thing is you're having this expectation or desire for the sensation of serenity. Huh? It won't come. You're getting a great, beautiful opportunity there to comprehend a desire. The desire for silence. Or the desire to others to bend to your will. It's a great chance to develop equanimity. Beautiful. The second question was about uh, if we have a pain, for example, in the body, and we are told to relax and accept the pain, how do we deal with that pain? How do we really work through it? In the same way. In this case, though, well, in both cases, really, if, if the irritating element, whether it's somebody outside or something inside, really poses the potential to create lasting harm. For example, if you're meditating and sitting on a tack, <laughs> get up and remove it. It's sort of common sense, right? Or if you're meditating in a room full of uh, feathers and they're blowing around and irritating you, making you sneeze, go to another room. You know, very obvious things you should just deal with. For example, if your neighbors are shooting guns, you should move. If you can, don't live there. Go somewhere else. But in most cases, the things that irritate us are simply irritating. They're really not going to hurt us. They just bother us. This is a great chance to develop equanimity, to learn to accept it. I traveled in India, and while I was there, many times... I saw people sleeping in streets while cars raced by. I saw people sleeping on piles of gravel. I couldn't even sit there because it would be so uncomfortable. These guys were sleeping on it. Oh, it's possible. The only reason I can't do it is because of my desire for comfort and a big fluffy pillow and a bed. Yeah. I'm not saying that you should go out and try and learn to do that. But it expresses a principle of psychology, which is that much of what we think we need, we really don't. 
It's psychological. Many people think they can only meditate on a particular cushion in a certain room at a certain time of day with certain music playing and certain incense and everything has to be exactly right and then they can meditate. This is wrong. A real master of meditation can meditate anywhere, anytime. Even while the physical body is awake and active and talking. And Samuel M. Vior was such a master and is such a master. And there are many others who can be talking to you, dealing with you, looking like a normal person, but psychologically inside, they're in samadhi. And this is not something unique to that person or that there's something inherently different about them. They've simply reached that level, and any of us can do it. That's part of the natural beauty of the consciousness. So learn to accept the unpleasant manifestations of your fellow men with gratitude. If your neighbors are noisy, if your legs are hurting, your back is hurting, oftentimes you'll find that if you just ignore it, you're aware of it, but you don't really put a lot of attention into it. After a few minutes, the pain is gone, and you thought you were going to die. I've had that experience many times. I sit to meditate, it's a huge pain in my back or my neck, and I'm so uncomfortable that I just keep relaxing and relaxing. And a little while later, I think, where did that go? I thought I was going to have to go to the hospital, and now there's nothing. It's my mind. Cain. Another question? Oh. <laughs> These guys keep trying to ask, but you keep... No, that's okay. The question is, is our aim to become nothing so we can receive divine guidance? Or should we always be meditating on egos? Well, the question is formed in a funny way. What I would say is, the, the fact is that we are nothing. Our goal is to realize it. We think we're something. We really think we're special. We think a lot of things about ourselves that have no truth. When we realize the nature of ourselves, the true nature, we realize that really we are nothing. And to our mind, this sounds horrible. Like, that's a terrible thing to say. How can you say that? We're all children of God. We're all beauty, this and that. But the truth is, this body is mostly empty space. And so are all the other bodies. And this self we have is temporal and illusory. The real self is empty of self-nature but it is beautiful. That true self is pure love. We can't comprehend that with this I. When we experience that, then we can understand it. Then we've had gnosis. When we've experienced what the real self is, a selfless self, then we know something of gnosis. And then we have a great power to help us overcome the ego and the self-delusion we've made. The goal is, yes, to become empty. A fully developed bodhisattva is empty. There is no I. There is only love. A fully developed bodhisattva does nothing for themselves and only for others. There is no I there, but there is God not that creator God on a throne, but Keter, the Dharmakaya, the Buddha, fully developed. That level does not have an I. And as we explained in a previous lecture about the forms of, or types of personality, the being has a solar personality, but it does not have I. It is a kind of love or a kind of supra-individuality that's beyond any concept that we could have about self. It is real, it is alive, but it is not individuality in the way we think of it. It is beyond individuality. It is individuality perfected. 
Yes, that's our goal, to become a vessel for that. We become nothing in context of ego, but we become something for the first time. Because while we are the way we are now, we are nothing. We think we have a, a big self and a big I, but it's nothing. It belongs to the abyss. It will decay and be destroyed. In the end of that, we'll have nothing real. But when we become nothing, psychologically, spiritually, then we really become something. Hmm? The intellect doesn't like this, but it is the truth. There's a question here. I stated, yes, that you have to leave your body to enter samadhi fully. Yes. Because given, I don't understand, I understand why you would need to leave your body to understand the ego at every level. But since form is emptiness, emptiness is form, why would, it, why would samadhi depend upon excluding the physical, physical sensation? Well, this is a philosophical conundrum. But I mean, in terms of, I mean... Let me answer, because it's a very good question. It's a very good question. But what I, the way I'm saying it is where the conundrum lies. The consciousness can be in the body and experience samadhi, but not while it's attached to the body. And that's the answer. The consciousness has to be free of that attachment. And that's when I say it has to be out. It means from that, free of the attachment. You can experience samadhi in your physical body even while you're awake, physically active. This is possible if you have the skill to do it. But that skill depends on not having attachment to the body. Does that make sense? Okay. Another question? Yeah, I have one back here. Um, what is the importance of working on the heart chakra when it can be so valid in concentration, concentration practice in relation to meditation? What is the importance of the vowel O in relation with the heart in relation with meditation. Um, in order for us to develop the skill of meditation, there are many tools that we use. Mantras are a very significant aspect of that. And another significant aspect is pranayama. Both of these activities harness and deliver energy. As we are now in our physical bodies, are able or our soul is here in the body, but asleep and trapped. We use these energies and forces in order to provide energy to the consciousness. Pranayama and transmutation provides enormous fuel <coughs> if we give it to the consciousness. And mantras provides an enormous fuel also. And depending on the mantra, it has different effects. The vowel O stimulates the heart. And the heart is intimately related with intuition and comprehension. But we also have many other mantras and vowels that we use to simulate the chakras or energetic centers. And also the different bodies or the blood or the mind, the brain. Many tools that we use. But in synthesis, all of them have one purpose. Give us energy to be awake. Simply that. The quicker you learn that, the quicker you can go beyond them. Meaning, many people learn mantras and they sit and they do repetitions of mantras. And in foundational level schools or Shravakayana schools, such as uh, Kriya Yoga and many of the other introductory yogas, they learn mantra repetition or japa in order to stimulate those energies and create those energies, but they don't learn how to use them. And we find that in this tradition also. People that do regular mantra repetition, but don't know how to use the energy. They don't awaken themselves with meditation or self-observation. They just do a lot of mantra. It's good. But unless you know how to harness the force, that energy, it could actually hurt you. Because you could be giving that energy to the ego. Like people who learn to transmute or do vowels, and they take all that energy, and then they go out and act like idiots. And all the energy just feeds their desire. And this is very common. So those practices are important, but have to be used wisely. In other words, when you learn to do a mantra, 
Do it consciously with awareness of what you're doing. Don't think about your dog or your homework or that girl you saw or that dress you want to buy while you're doing mantras because you're wasting your time. When you're doing your vocalization, you're doing your pranayamas, you're doing your runes, you're doing Tibetan exercises, you need to be fully aware of yourself, remembering yourself, so that, that energy will feed your consciousness. If you're distracted, all that energy is going to waste. At best, you're just dispersing it into the atmosphere. And at worst, you're feeding your ego. Mm. So be careful. Use them well. They're very powerful tools, and they can help you a lot. But use them consciously. Don't be mechanical. Another question? What would you say about the uh, blue time ther therapeutics that the master talks about in the, the revolution of dialectic? Yeah, the chapter blue time or rest therapeutics is, is exactly what I've been talking about in the whole lecture today. It's exactly that. If you study that chapter, you'll get what I'm trying to explain. I'm not as good at it as he is. I mean, some island viewers are a master. I'm just a fool. But that chapter is beautiful. Also, the chapter Revolution of Meditation and the Dominion of the Mind in the book Revolution of the Dialectic. That whole book explains what I'm talking about today. But that book is intimidating. <laughs> it's very deep. Another question? Is samadhi the same as receiving information in meditation? Well, yes and no. Receiving information in meditation begins the instant you pay attention to yourself. That's where it starts. Comprehension starts as soon as you become aware of yourself. Because in that instant you realize you're not paying attention and you need to pay attention. That's comprehension. And then as you observe your tension or your anger or your fear, you learn about it. That's information. That's why we meditate. Don't think that information is just being taken out of your body into the Himalayan mountains and being shown ancient texts and being all these secrets revealed to you. Yeah, that's great. But that's not going to fundamentally change your suffering. What's going to change your suffering is learning about your ego, learning about your personality, your tendencies, your habits. Comprehension begins there. Samadhi is a state of consciousness where your ego no longer traps you. The consciousness is completely out of the ego. That is Samadhi. When the consciousness is awake, and has no obscuration, that is samadhi. That's why I'm saying it can happen in your physical body. It's dependent only on the consciousness being free of ego. So you can have samadhi in your physical body, your vital body, your astral body, your mental body, causal body, buddhic body, atmic body, and beyond. But one speck of dust of desire stops it. One more question. Mm -hmm. What is a good way to utilize our transmuted energies? A good way to use your transmuted energies is to remember. Hmm? She, said, she says consciously. Consciously, to use those energies is to remember yourself. To be in a constant state of inner watchfulness. That is the 100% best thing to do. Beyond that, do what you want. Do your will. Live how you must live. You have to follow the guidance of your being. No one's here to tell you what to do. No school, no teacher, no anyone can tell you you have to behave like this and that and imitate this person and be like that. No, be yourself. Be who you are, but be cognizant of that. And that will use those energies effectively and give you great serenity. Yes? You mentioned, um, and I agree with this, that uh, you shared your meditations come mostly from your being as far as your instructions. 
instruction. Um, you also said to get from other traditions how to practice meditation, be Buddhism, Gnosticism. Um, but I've heard in other lectures that you know Gnosticism is somehow one we are taught for the Aquarian age that it's what was mentioned that other traditions how they teach are outdated. Mm-hmm. Um, well, certainly our backbone then be of the Gnostic meditations and from our own beings. It's mentioned that other. Of course, naturally. If we want to take full advantage of this new era and the Christic forces that are flowing right now to help all of us, we should aspire to learn that teaching, which came primarily through Samael and Bior and continues to come through him. And there are many practices that he gave. But unfortunately, a lot of his students fail to understand those teachings and those practices. And it's useful then especially for those who are more intellectual, to study the traditions of other systems so that they can better understand what Samael taught. And he recommended that. We should study the scriptures, the sutras, the tantras, in order for us to really grasp what this modern system is all about. It's not that everyone has to do that. It's especially useful for people who are intellectual because it's the intellectual type of person that has the most trouble with meditation. People who are more instinctive or body-oriented have troubles with meditation in their own way, but not because of the ideas of the practices or the concepts. And people who are more emotional in their idiosyncrasy have different struggles, right? But generally, these two types are able to meditate more rapidly and easily than intellectual type of people. The intellectuals are the ones who get stuck in the mind, stuck in concepts, stuck in, maybe I'm doing this wrong. Right? He said it like this, like this, like this, and it has to be in this order. That's intellectual. Right? That's the challenge. And so, in that way, feeding that intellectual aspect with some good knowledge can help disempower it, can give it clarity, so it can then relax. Because usually the intellect is in conflict when it doesn't fully understand something. When it understands, usually it'll shut up. Right? So, that's a good technique that some people can utilize. But overall, I agree with you. It's totally, absolutely right. Uh, the, many of the books and traditions and techniques that we can study about now are antiquated. Right? We don't really need them now. Thousands of them. And we're in a new era, a new age, with a new science. An ancient science, but now is revealed anew. So if we rely on that, it can take us all the way if we understand how to use it. Is there another question? Okay, thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.